All right, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, welcome to this panel on the rule of law reports, protecting media pluralism and independence. I'm uh, Serena Epis, editor and researcher at OBC TransEuropa. Please let me introduce you to our two speakers, Tom Gibson, EU representatives and advocacy manager at the Committee to Protect the Journalists, and Andrea Miapace, executive director of the Italian Coalition of Civil Liberties and Rights. Welcome both Tom and Andrea, and thank you very much for joining us to this panel. I take just um, a moment to introduce the topic, to present the topic of the panel, which is the EU rule of law mechanism, the EU rule of law reports in particular, and its potential as an advocacy tool to protect journalism and media freedom. Uh, since 2020, the European Commission publishes its uh, annual reports through which it uh, monitors the developments across EU member states in four key areas related to the rule of law, one of them being media freedom and the pluralism. Uh, for the first time last year, the European Commission also included some recommendations addressed to member states. And in preparing the reports, the European Commission consults not only uh, relevant and competent national authorities, but also other relevant stakeholders such as the civil society organizations. The, exercise, the, the, the monitoring exercise of the European Commission can indeed benefit the work of civil society organiz organizations that work for the protection of fundamental rights, such as uh, the freedom of expression. So I would start by asking uh, Tom, what is the potential, precisely what is the potential of the rule of law report to protect, to strengthen the protection of independent journalism? And what are its strengths and eventual weaknesses of such uh, an instrument? Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, uh, the message to take away uh, from the Committee to Protect Journalists for today is like uh, the European Commission has gone uh, a long way, but it needs to go further. And that uh, we have the European elections next year. Um, and that has to be a moment where Brussels and the European Commission, the European Parliament, etc., really look to the rule of law reports as um, a real vehicle, um, a way of actually improving the press freedom situation in the member states. Um, I mean, let me just take a little step back because we do have to acknowledge just how far um, this has gone. I started with the Committee to Protect Journalists in 2017. One of the first meetings I had was with uh, MEP Sophie Interveld, um, a Dutch liberal uh, MEP who had been pushing this within Parliament. Um, we had done a report on the rule of law mechanism, but this really at that stage was, um, it was a dream. It really was a dream. Um, and then since then, um, uh, Brussels woke up very much to the, the, the threat that illiberal governments were, were putting on the EU. Obviously, the two examples, Hungary and Poland, um, uh, the usual suspects, we know, we know all about them. Um, and then in 2017 and 18, um, the murders of Daphne Caruana Galicia in, in Malta and also Jan Cusack in Slovakia, then changed to 2019, uh, I would say that the, the elections, the mandate of the new commission, we saw the European Democracy Action Plan, we saw a whole raft of different reforms. And one of those is, is the rule of law mechanism. So I just want to say that, you know, we've come an awful long way. Um, and that back in those days, back in 2017, there was a lot more, I'd say, uh, pressure um, on the commission um, around not overstepping the mark uh, in terms of what it could or couldn't say towards member states. And I think this is a very important uh, aspect of the discussion today, because there's this constant battle between what Brussels can do and what the member states will allow Brussels to do. Um, and so therefore, I'm a, a sort of a critical fan of the rule of law report. There's enormous potential. Um, but we need we need more political pressure, um, both from the Council, but also from from the European Commission. Um, uh, I mean, I can go a little bit into the, the the report itself. I mean, look, there are certain challenges that we we see. Um, we would like to have a bit more coordination, transparency with civil society groups and the Commission. Country missions do occur, um, but they aren't something that necessarily we can all engage in or follow. Um, 
civil society makes inputs for the rule of law reports, but again, the methodology isn't necessarily something which we can see. And so I think there's a level of frustration among certain civil society groups around their inputs. Um, uh, we pushed for a long time to have recommendations and recommendations were key to this process. If you're going to actually put benchmarks in and we're going to see progress one way or the other as to whether or not things are improving, we have to be able to articulate what our demands actually are. And so we were very happy um, when uh, uh, recommendations were suddenly included uh, last year. But then uh, again, this is my reading of it. The recommendations just aren't specific or measurable enough. You know, they're, they're very uh, general. Um, what we really need is very clear demands put to the member states which both we can use as these sort of benchmarks for seeing progress, but also ways that we can very easily engage and understand what's happening nationally, uh, and ways that uh, national press freedom advocates can also work with the likes of, of uh, myself in Brussels so that we can have a joint conversation around what actually needs to take place at national level. Um, uh, I, I think we should turn this into a discussion, so I'm going to stop there. But look, I do think uh, something that is positive about this process is that the Commission um, has always been open to our recommendations on how to improve the process. Uh, it hasn't been fixed from the start. Um, you know, the Commission did listen to us about including recommendations. I do think that they're hearing us around, um, you know, this 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 demand to make them more uh, to make them more precise, to make them more measurable. Um, we saw the inclusion of public service media. Uh, which had previously been admitted. So they are open to improving the process. Um, but as I said, I mean, it's going to be a, a very important moment next year with elections to really uh, put forward our arguments for making this work. You know, the, 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 the test here is that we actually, if we're going to have this conversation in five years' time, we will be able to see that the rule of law uh, reports do influence things nationally and that journalists are saying this is a great process um, and we can see the difference because of it. Thank you very much, Tom, for pointing out the great importance of the rule of law report as an instrument, but also some of the shortcomings that connect into its process. Um, I will leave uh, the floor to you, Andreas, Andrea, straight away. I just wanted to point out that the Italian Coalition for Civil Liberties and Rights is one of the Italian civil society organizations that works on the rule of law mechanism of the Commission at national level, but also at the European level as part of the Liberties Coalition. So my question for you is, what is the um, experience of the Italian Coalition on the rule of law report? Uh, does this instrument, does this Euro European instrument have a visibility among civil society in the Italian context and also in the public debate and within the media landscape? Thank you, Serena. And I couldn't agree more with Tom about the process and how we started and how we can improve it. We push with our partner Liberties to have this mechanism. And now we are in the process to participate. And uh, as far as we see from a national point of view, at least in Italy, there is not like such a huge debate around the report and the findings, probably because of the political climate, but also because of the, the way the report has been designed is still, is, is potentially still on, on, on paper. Uh, what we are doing now, what we have done this year compared to the last, uh, last year was to try to engage with as many organizations as possible around drafting the, the content. And then we organized the, the, the drafts of a kind of shadow report. And then we partnered with Liberties to combine uh, a report covering uh, most of the European countries, which is good in terms of the process, in terms of engaging. But we haven't seen such uh, uh, an interest from media organization because it looks on from the outside, it still looks like something on top of something else. Like there are many reports, there are many organizations looking at what's happening in the country, but very few of these experiments uh, see things happening in between reports. So what we would like to see next is to the European Commission to step up its game in terms of the mechanism. Uh, they are open to, to suggestions and this is great. 
uh, at the same time, what we would like to see is like more specific recommendation in order to steer a debate at the national level. So we need to be able to focus on single case studies or single specific policy provisions, either under discussion or uh, approved uh, in, in the national context uh, in order to steer in, an interest from, from media and start the public debate. So the, the country, also member states, they need to do something uh, because of the overall report. The, there needs to be a follow-up mechanism, uh, a kind of action plan around the recommendations, for example. But as long as the recommendations are not specific enough, are not smart enough, there is no point to have a follow-up uh, report and follow-up mechanism on any action point that could be taken into very actionable um, initiatives. That's, the, that's our, our main concern. So there is a lot of things to do around the report. It has a great potential both from civil society, from member states and from the, the commission, there needs to be, I think, more investment in making this real uh, and living up to, to the full potential of this, uh, of this mechanism. In the future, of course, as a civil society organization working on, on human rights, we are never satisfied by the level of freedom and, uh, and civil liberties that we have, but we could start thinking about how to improve it in uh, in the very short term as well. So yeah, that's our our experience so so far. So it's not like it's a shared responsibility. Thank you, Andrea, also for uh, giving these insights into the uh, Italian context. Well, um, as a follow-up question that I would like to address to both of you, I actually wanted to ask you, maybe going more in specific on what is the way ahead? You already mentioned some uh, issues that should be addressed, for example, concerning the recommendation. You said recommendation should be more specific, there should be a follow-up mechanism. So my question for you is, what could be done uh, actually to uh, strengthen this instrument so that it, so that it can actually have uh, an effect, be more effective in changing the situation on the ground concerning the rule of law? What is your opinion, your ideas on, on this? I will start maybe, I don't know, Andrea or, or Tom, you, you decide. Yeah. I think one very practical um, improvement could be for the member states to be able to open up a consultation, for example, on the findings of the raw report, see some um, commitments from the government in order to improve the situation on the ground. That could be something that I think is very, very doable. And uh, it doesn't need a lot of investment, a lot of effort from, from the member states. Uh, that's definitely something that's, that could be seen in the future. But also the European Commission telling member states, look, you need, for example, to publish the rule of law report, to disseminate the rule of law report, to have some kind of reaction on that. Otherwise, it's going to be business as usual, because there are many reports about what's happening on media freedom on other kind of issues. And uh, and we need to focus on the on on the lively stuff between reports. So it's it's too long to wait twelve months to see what is happening in one country. We should have a rapid reaction in terms of conversation, in terms of debate, in terms of policy action, together with other uh, organizations. But also they should, for example, they should make the member states open at least one national debate around the rule of law report. They have to do it um, in order to, to make this, uh, this instrument more, more effective. Of course, what we would like to see is conditionality, but this is not going to happen very soon, unfortunately. But conditionality to access EU funds according to how you score uh, on the rule of law report would be the, the, the greatest achievement possible. Um, I mean, look, I, I agree with basically a lot of that. I would also just look, we just have to open up this debate. Um, we have to make the rule of law report visible and accessible. Um, and one way, a very pragmatic thing that we have suggested is the Commission set up country pages, dates of visits, what were the recent recommendations? How can you engage a civil society? When's the next debate coming up? What's the discussion to make this 
this whole process uh, vibrant to turn it into something which people can actually use. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's also a bit of an elephant in the room here, which is that, you know, what we're seeing around Europe is this sort of political toing and froing between um, uh, more populist or illiberal uh, governments or political parties or figures with perhaps some more sort of centralist or perhaps liberal um, other side of, of the fence. Um, and, you know, the fact is, is that a number of um, these more populist or illiberal, illiberal governments or political figures, they, they don't want to be criticised. Um, and we also have to frame press freedom within the other um, areas of assessment, which include justice and corruption and institutional checks and balances. You know, um, what we're seeing in so many different EU member states is, is people deliberately trying to control um, laws and institutions so that they can retain political power. That, that's, that's what they're trying to do, and they don't want to be criticised. So we have to say, um, in order for, for this process to really work, we have to, we have to open up that space for real engagement with civil society. And we have to talk about the nuts and bolts around constructive criticism and what needs to take place on the ground. Um, we'll also, it's a great way of seeing through national implementation of the EU, EU's uh, press freedom reforms, like the journalist safety recommendation of 2021. Um, uh, hopefully like um, the implementation, the successful implementation of the European Media Freedom Act, of the anti slap directive in the future, when they're transposed into national laws. Um, this mechanism would allow for, for that level of oversight. Um, and just one last uh, mention of like conditionality um, and, and funds. I mean, yes, I, I do think that uh, this at the moment seems like a very ambitious request, but then um, uh, it's going to be key to follow what happens um, with uh, the invocation of, of the withholding of funds to Hungary and to see where that leads. Um, as we know, the current withholding of uh, uh, funds because of rule of law breaches, it can only be made if it affects the EU's budget. But, you know, why can't we broaden the scope of that? Um, you know, we've come so far, uh, at least uh, you know, since 2017, with this debate. Why can't it go further? Because ultimately... Brussels is going to be faced with a real question here, which is, where is the carrot? Where is the stick? What is the real leverage that we have here? And how is this process actually going to be successful? How are we actually going to use this process to put pressure on the member states? Um, and that's going to be the key. That will be the key. And that will be um, a discussion that we can have in five years time. And the, the, the test will be, Will individuals, will EU citizens report that they see change because of this? Thank you very much again, Andrea and Tom, for this uh, really um, insightful conversation and, and very short discussion. We would need, of course, more time to discuss and to go in deep in this question, but I think that we, we surely put a lot of food for thought on the table today. And, and overall, I believe that in light of the uh, worrying developments regarding the rule of law in many EU member states, the EU rule of law mechanism, despite the shortcomings that you pointed out today, remains an instrument of the utmost importance to protect uh, um, fundamental values uh, such as the freedom of expression. Um, so I thank you again, really, for this very brief discussion, but very, very interesting and insightful. And uh, I hope there will be other occasions to discuss about and to reflect about this, uh, this important topic. Uh, for now, I thank you again, and uh, I hope that you can enjoy the rest of the summit. Thank you.